way. So you are a logical minded math teacher. Great with the analytical stuff, sharp mind, step by step, and a good logical thinker. And so am I, same. Uh, but I'm also creative and everyone is, and so are you. Even if you don't think of yourself as a creative person, maybe you're not a painter and you don't do ceramics in your free time, but there's something you do that is creative and putting something forth into the world and getting your brain thinking differently. So maybe it's, you know, making a new recipe is your creative passion and you may not think of it as creative, but you're always doing something with your hands and especially just teaching. You're creating lessons, you're building knowledge, you're putting something forth into the world and into your students. And so everyone has a creative mind and I want you to think of that in your own self, but also your students. They are naturally creative. And I'm here to show you how and why to embrace their creativity and get that involved in class. Yes, even in math, where we don't necessarily tend to see that as often. So did you know that more than half of the brain is designed to process images? But if you look at the typical math notebook, every page looks the same. You'll see maybe vocabulary, example problems, lots of words, lots of numbers, and students can't imagine their page because they haven't interacted with it creatively. It doesn't have pictures and flow. And so when they're sitting there on the test, maybe blanking, if they try to picture the page where they learn that information and reference it in their mind, it all blurs together. And so I'm here to encourage you to let your students have some more creative output they sit so much, especially right now, in just input mode where they're, you know, following links, watching videos, reading what we send, and processing, but their brains need to process in a way that they are putting something out and putting forth creative output as well. So I am Bridget from Math Giraffe, and that's where I teach how to teach math creatively and some unique ideas. Um, and then I also have the doodle note method I've developed and of course the doodle note club that goes along with that doodlenotes.org where we are really taking over the world of visual note taking and making it accessible to students. And then my most recent project, I'm actually making a magazine, a creative lifestyle magazine just for teachers of all subject areas, um, which has been a really fun project too. But all around, I'm about embracing creative approaches and really getting both sides of the brain working together. So that's the first piece of research that actually comes in here is about the brain hemispheres. And especially in math class, when you're combining logical left brain math with artistic creativity, it's a little bit different than what we usually see in a math class. But those are the two sides of the brain. So you've probably heard the left brain has, you know, the mathematical, the um, linguistic words and numbers um, and processes all that in a logical sequenced way. Whereas the right brain has the artistic side, the creativity, and is for more of that different expression thinking outside the box. Now between the two, there's a little fiber bridge. And when you can get the neural pathways to cross over by activating the left side and the right side of the brain at the same time, that's when the magic really happens. And you increase students' ability to focus, learn, and really remember and retain everything. And that's really our goal, long-term retention of what we're teaching them. So you've probably seen the mindset where we teach, you know, oh, you're left-brained or you're right-brained, and you might have an image of yourself as being one or the other. Um, but really, all individuals use both sides of their brain, and they use them really frequently and often together, but maybe in different proportions. So our goal is to activate the right and the left side of the brain both really strongly and get them working together. And that's going to increase the student's memory of what you're teaching. So you can even actually 
surprisingly, do this physically because each side of the brain controls one side of the body. And so you can even warm your students' brains and bodies up by having them touch their right elbow to their left knee or vice versa, because that'll actually, in a little way, activate that crossover between the two hemispheres. Um, the other piece of research that kind of goes into what we're talking about here, there's quite a few, um, is that they have found that drawing leads to an increase in memory. And so in this study, there were uh, two groups given lists of words, just basic words, car, truck, whatever. And the one group was so told, okay, here, memorize these. You can write them down to try to remember them. The other group was drawing the words. And it turned out that by studying with drawing pictures of each word, they were able to remember almost twice as well as the group who did not draw the words, maybe just wrote them and tried to memorize them. And so we have found that drawing, sketching, even if it's not a perfect picture, is going to help your students to remember something. Now, sometimes this is a little tricky in math, but we can draw a big picture concept and imagine something as a funnel in certain cases, or a flow through pipes in certain cases where it's, you know, different steps. Uh, some concepts are maybe a hierarchy and you could see it in a pyramid. Some concepts are more like a web where you have multiple types of things. And so if you think back to your graphic organizers, that's where those can come into play. Students can draw a big picture idea, but if you think it through, you can also get your students drawing specific concepts. So for surface area, if they draw the word surface area within a paintbrush, they're going to then remember how they lettered that in, two words, surface area, they wrote one on the bristles, and then they'll know that's like painting the outside of the figure. Whereas if they write volume in pretty letters or whatever into a faucet shape, they'll remember that word connects in their minds. You build a mental pathway and they'll remember that's like filling up the shape. Anytime you can connect these and make more brain connections, you're going to increase the probability that the student will understand and remember the content. Plus, they focus better. Another bonus, creativity is actually good for their mental health. Anytime you can get them, you know, coloring, creative output, it's relaxing, it helps the kids with math anxiety. So you really wanna embrace these different visual, creative, and interactive approaches, even in a, just a typical boring old math lesson. The next uh, study that really fascinated me about the drawing and memory was actually about doodling. So even when students aren't drawing anything that means anything or has anything to do with the lesson, if they're just doodling in the margins, that even increases their ability to recall what you were talking about at the time they were taking those notes. Um, it, it actually helps them focus in on the audio input that their brain is receiving while they're kind of just doodling and using their hands. Um, there's a strong hand to mind connection. And so you might realize, oh, I've done that like in a staff meeting or whatever, you know, oh, I remember he did say that I was drawing little triangles around the date or something like that. And it, it doesn't have anything to do with what was being said, but it just still focuses your mind, builds a mental pathway and you can recall something. And so a lot of times if you can get your kids sketching or doodling, um, even better if it's related to the content, that will increase their ability to remember. Um, it actually turns out that learning styles, which we're so used to, um, like, you know, visual learner, um, an auditory learner, those are turning out to be found that they're a myth. And so people really cling hard to that and it's hard to give up that idea, but it's been found now more recently, the neuroscientists have, neuroscientists have discovered that all human brains, in fact, learn best by a combination of visual and linguistic input. And so when you can combine the visual and the auditory of the teacher's words and or the text of, you know, a written word, you're automatically boosting the student's ability to really focus and remember the information. So what you want to do is blend 
a picture or a visual with linguistic information, your voice entering their mind in the background and written linguistic information. When you can blend those, I call this a visual memory trigger, like our surface area paintbrush example. That's gonna be the best learning tool you can give your students. So this concept is actually called dual coding theory, and it better describes how brains process information than the learning styles model really does. So the dual coding combined with picture superiority effect, which actually tells us how a picture is more valuable to our brains and helps us learn and remember better than just words. Those two combine together and help students imagine and visualize a concept and build those brain triggers. Uh, the, the picture superiority effect works like a stop sign. You don't read the word stop every time and think of it as a word at all. Your brain just knows the signal. You see really the red, you see the shape, and that picture is what really triggers your mind to do what it needs to do. Um, so you'll see this in a lot of cases where you can visualize and bring up in your mind a picture of something you've seen more easily than a direct quote or you know a phrasing or word. So that visual input really is strong, stronger sometimes than the linguistic input, but the best is when they're working together. So when we combine those two and let students get creative with, you know, coloring, interacting with the visuals, doing their hand lettering within the shape to form a picture, that's the really strongest learning cues we can give them. Here's a little more detail on the dual coding theory and how it really works. So our visual input into our brain and any auditory or linguistic word input into the brain actually are processed in two completely different centers of the brain when they're separate. But when we can link those two regions of the brain together and combine the visual pictures, images, action input, with the linguistic input, like the teacher's voice, speech that's being heard, and text on a page, either in a book or on a notebook page, then we're gonna strengthen the links between those within the brain. And then when the brain converts that information into memory, it's got a better link between the areas of the brain, and that strengthens the uh, student's ability to recall that information down the road. So knowing why we really need to embrace all of this and get this involved in our class, um, I want to teach you a little bit about how, because you need specific strategies, but also you just don't have time. When you're in the thick of it, you're not, you know, creating all these crafty lessons from scratch and you need efficiency. And so the easy and quick way to make this happen and have your students interact with their math content in this way is really what you need. Um, so the visual vocabulary is one way. Visual vocabulary prompts for your students. And this is nice because they're doing the work. They're going to develop the magical memory trigger that will blend the visual and linguistic information for them. Then they'll go back later, use it as a study guide. So visual vocabulary is one way. And the best way to do this is just with prompts. And so I'll show you some examples of this. And I'm gonna include in your free resource some visual vocabulary prompts, templates that you can just print and use just as they are. Here's a closer look at what I mean by visual vocabulary. This is an opportunity for kids to use their own creativity to build a memory cue for themselves. So it will say sketch a visual reminder or develop an advertisement for the concept or draft a graphic design in the form of a magazine cover or an art installation. And the students come up with a pictorial representation of some kind that creatively blends the actual term, that's the text or linguistic component, with an image, the visual component. Here's an example. The V and the A for the vertical angles form the graphic reminder. Or here the letters forming the word gravity are being pulled toward the center. These are fun, but they also make great study guides. And it's really cool to see how much more eager students are to pull out their notes and reference sheets like this when they've put their own personal creative stamp on it. They love to look at them again and show them off because they feel a lot of ownership and are proud of their artistic work. I've included some of these in your creative math toolkit, so make sure you grab that and check out all the goodies I've collected in there for you to try.
Okay, another tool you can really easily put to use here just by twisting something you've probably already got in your file cabinet, graphic organizers. So what I like to do is combine graphic organizers with a little bit of the concept of doodle notes where students are going to sketch or draw and use color coding as they interact with a graphic organizer. Now, my favorite graphic organizers, I've created a lot of templates that are half page size. And this is really nice for students who need less per page. It makes them really bite-sized. They can flip through and have a deck of study guide cards, and it just feels so much more manageable to them than filling up an entire notebook page. So they'll take the template and they'll really do the, a lot of times I think the ideal here is actually for them to choose the template because then they're thinking about how the information interacts in a big picture way. Does one piece of this content lead to the other? Is this a lesson with maybe three subtopics that work, you know, in a cycle, like converting fractions, decimals, percents? Do I want that kind of structure? Or, you know, once they've, this is once they've had a little, um, a little bit of background in the lecture. Do I want to represent this information, you know, from my notes and convert it into a series of steps? Or is this concept more of, you know, two branches of the same idea? And so this way they can really organize that metacognition where they're thinking about how this concept should be thought of and represented, then they're representing it in that way. And definitely encourage hand lettering, coloring, um, little doodles and sketches, arrows to show relationships between ideas. But graphic organizers, if you really use them wisely, you can amp these up and way step up the game since, you know, the graphic organizers we used back in the 80s, 90s, <laughs> whenever they first came around. So graphic organizers, especially just half page bite sized cards are a wonderful tool and I will be providing you with some of those as well. Ideally, you'll have your students select their own layout. This requires them to think about how the big picture components of the lesson content are interrelated and how many different subtopics or subcategories are at play. And then they can think about whether it's a flow chart type of model with three different steps maybe, or it's a comparison model with two different key terms and their meanings. Or maybe the lesson material fits best into a web type of structure with branches coming out from a central theme. Sometimes maybe it's more of a hierarchy or layered subtopics. Kids can choose out of all the graphic organizer cards that would possibly be a fit and then select the one that best represents the structure of this lesson and then fill in the details. You can narrow it down for them too and offer just like five options that would all work well. I have tips for this in the directions for this card deck and you have a sample pack of these in your bonus files. Encourage lots of color, creative hand lettering, doodles, sketches, and embellishments. When you first start incorporating more creativity in your math class, you'll need to begin with plenty of structure. By providing a basic structure, or at least teaching them how to determine their own basic structure, you're going to keep them from being paralyzed by a blank page. Teach your students that some content can be organized visually into connected parts with different layouts to visually represent the connection between the parts. Those different components can connect in a few different ways. Some content might be organized into steps or stages, like if you teach three steps for a process of solving a certain type of equation, for example. Other content might be structured visually into layers or stacks and so on. You can use templates for these, but it's also really great to train kids to develop their own. And you can develop some custom layouts for them as well. We have clip art custom design for this purpose over in the Doodle Note Club. There are tons of resources on that site if you do want to dive deeper into some of this. But I also have this free resource guide that helps students learn how to plan their own layouts and think about all the different ways to organize information in a more visual way. Another way to get kids creating their own inventive output and interacting with the lesson concept um, is to try like a choice board. You know, you can do the typical choice board where they can either write a song or poem about the content or create a poster that represents it. And those are great. I found them really even more valuable ways to keep it a little more open-ended. And so um, one idea I recently blogged about is you can do a like tactile formula. And so students just had to find some kind of material and represent the formula written out with it, but they had to choose something meaningful for what the elements and variables in the formula actually represent. 
So for example, y equals mx plus b the, with the x made out of coins because those are input to the candy machine while the y is made out of m&ms because those are the output of the candy machine. And so they think of their own way, but that really helps it stick in their mind. This takes their time and not yours. So it's a really efficient way to get those brain waves going and they get to be creative. They can really, they, they go crazy outside the box and come up with a really cool idea. And all you've done is provide the prompt. And so think of your job as really just prompting their creativity, giving them the structure to do so. And that's the same with the doodle notes compared to like just sketch notes is that you provide the structure so that they have the idea. They're not looking at a blank page and just feeling totally stumped. Um, as you know, creativity really comes the most when you have a structure and a challenge that you're inside a box and yet you can think creatively outside the box to make it happen. Kids will definitely get creative with this. Here's a completely different creative approach to representing the same formula. The choice of materials is still meaningful and a little funnier, but it shows an understanding of the different components of the formula. Um, the bobby pins representing slope because they slant in different ways in your hair. And like slope, hair days could be positive or negative. I mean, they really understood the different things going on there. And then the puzzle pieces are the variables because they're like an unknown mystery, just like a puzzle. And then the, the keys and the pasta, just a little filler in the formula for the plus and the equals. And you can really do this kind of thing with any different formula that you're wanting students to memorize and understand. And rather than just memorizing the pieces, they're going to memorize the meaning of each piece and really think about it and reflect and represent it in a creative way they're proud of. Okay, another really cool hack I want to share with you, um, and there's so many ways to use this. Um, is if you like the concept of interactive notebooks, you will love to use stickers and labels and things like that in your students' notebooks. And so this is really handy for when you want to provide some kind of structure or template for them, but you want it right inside their notebook. And um, what I like to do is get a big pack of just full, full page sticker sheets, and they're not too, too expensive it's you know you can find them in bulk but obviously that's a bit of an expense but I'll print directly on those sticker sheets and so you can do so many things with this and I'm going to share a bunch of ideas but as you get going you'll end up finding more and more ways to use this kind of idea as they stick it into their notebook so one idea is for coordinate planes anytime you want your kids to have a coordinate plane I know it's such a pain those little stamps that they then have to share or pass around or you have to do it all or put it on paper and then they stick it in the side and it falls out so if they have a strip or a whole page of coordinate planes in their possession if each kid has a sticker sheet they can just put one on every time you're doing an example like okay stick the coordinate plane right here we're gonna graph linear equations and that is a really handy way. And you can do the same thing with number lines when you're teaching integers. You can do this with all kinds of just tools that you wish they had right in their notebook and you sometimes do on separate paper. Um, and then another way is with those graphic organizers or with a doodle note template or anything like that. You can print it directly on sticker paper and you can cut them in half and distribute them or you can make students cut themselves and they can instantly, without messy glue sticks or any of that, they can stick that right on their page and have the beginning structure of whatever you're going to teach that day. And so it's kind of an in-between way where instead of, you know, a pre-made handout um, or something like that, you have an in-between way instead of just plain old notes, something they can get creative with really quickly and easily. Um, another, you can do color coding with this as well. So you can get just, you know, neon colored label stickers and they can use those in so many different ways by just sticking them all over their notebook. And that doesn't even require you printing on them at a time, although you can. Sticker paper is actually pretty easy to print on. You can find templates. I'm gonna provide you with some templates that you can print directly on there. A couple of full page sticker sheets go a long way when you print and just have them on hand for each kid. They can use them all semester by just having them cut out the few pieces they need for today's notes, peel and stick it right on today's notebook page.
another fun little creative trick is to use stencils. And this is more like if you're for yourself, you want to do a little crafty hobby on the back end, you can kind of create your own little graphic organizer template for whatever your lesson content is. So my templates might work for some things for you, but then maybe you need something with five subcategories that flow with arrows in this direction or something like that. So if you just copy it with stencils, um, or sticker labels, or you know, you can do this on a screen with clip art as well. Then you can photocopy your page and you've made a template for your whole class to use, to interact with doodle color code and use creatively. Um, I do teach if you want to do this with, um, on the screen and kind of build your own doodle note pages. Um, I can teach you how to do that. I have the Doodle Note Club for that to teach you how to, you know, put the clip art on there and there's some specialized graphics in there to make it super easy for you. Um, but really, if you're just a by hand teacher, you can also do that with your own hands and then photocopy it. So I hope you're super inspired and you got kind of your own creative vibes flowing from this, but um, your students will just love getting their own creativity involved in your class as well. Um, it's, it's just really fun. It kind of brightens up their mood. They really just love this stuff, pulling out their colored pencils and getting like even in math class and they'll remember it, you know, more easily. Um, students with special needs especially love those bite-sized graphic organizers and turning those into their very own doodle notes that they'll, you know, reference. They get so proud to pull it back out and use things when any student who's created something themselves, they just love, they're more likely to use it, study it. They loved creating it. They're proud of how it turned out and they will pull that thing out as a study guide or just to show off to people because they made it themselves and there's such pride in that. There's such a just brain lights up from it. There's such rewards, mentally rewards, physical health rewards from getting creative. You're really doing wonders for your students anytime you can get that creativity involved. And it's harder in math, it's a little bit of a hurdle, but it's just so worth it. And I hope you really love all these free resources and I hope this gets you kind of excited about it. It's fun stuff, get a little crafty. Um, it's, it's a great kind of hobby for yourself to come up with some new creative ways. And if you need help, just reach out. I am here, I'm really passionate about getting creativity involved in math class and I'm happy to give a hand. Um, I'd love to hear more from you and thank you so much. Let me know what else I can do to help you out. The fun part will be testing out some of these creative strategies with the toolkit that I've prepared for you. Check out what I provided for you throughout the emails I'll be sending in these next days. Um, I'll be sending you stuff throughout the next few weeks actually. I've got a ton of free stuff for you. Um, and you can get your own creative juices flowing. I'll be sending you plenty of downloads to build up um, your own toolkit for helping you teach math more creatively, stuff you can use right in your own classroom. Um, keep checking your inbox. You'll see some templates, some graphic organizers that you can try with the sticker paper or just on regular paper, some visual vocabulary templates, uh, even a whole DIY kit for some doodle note templates. I'll also be sending plenty of support, tips, more information, and ideas. So I'm here throughout your journey. Um, let me know if you need any support or if you have any other questions, you can just reply.